Hello there and welcome back to another video here on Wrist Watch Revival. I'm Marshall. Thank you so much for taking the time to hang out with me and dive into this beautiful little hobby of watchmaking, watch restoration, watch repair. This time on the bench, we have an Omega Seamaster 30. This is one of my favorite types of vintage watches. I've actually done one of these uh, before and this is the, the sort of the sweet spot for me. This is somewhere in the $350 to $750 range for, for uh, an older one of these from the 60s. They're beautiful little watches with a big variation on dials. And this one I actually got off of eBay for a very good deal, although it's advertised as not working. As you can see, it's not running at all. Um, I can put a wind in it, but nothing happens, and I've kind of given it, a, given it a shake and everything. The thing that kind of stood out to me about this one in particular was the bracelet. It's got this really cool kind of mesh-linked bracelet thing that I haven't really seen before, and I thought that kind of stood out. Also, I really like the dial. It's got a somewhat textured white dial on it that looked to be in really good shape from the eBay listing, and I figure, well, I can give a good shot of fixing whatever's going on with it. You can see it's pretty dirty, it needs to be cleaned up at least a bit. Of course, we just have to get this bracelet off of here first to kick things off before we dive into the movement and get assessing exactly what's going on with it. But yeah, I got a very good deal on this and I figure, you know, I've got a spare, I've got spare parts for these. This, this uh, the movement inside this watch is the Omega 286. It's a fantastic movement, you'll, you'll get to see uh, when we get into the case. Here's the uh, spring bars though. They have not been changed in a very long time on this watch. And in fact, they broke as I took them off. They're corroded and crusty and just dirty and gross. So we'll be uh, replacing those. Spring bars, thankfully, are very cheap. You can get the you know, whole box of a few hundred of, hundred of them for you know 20 bucks, 30 bucks, something like that. So they're really not that expensive and it's definitely worth it to just switch them out if you have any doubt at all. So let's get the watch case opener going so that we can get into this thing. Yeah, this is a Seamaster 30. Again, these ones were made in the 60s and I absolutely love this, this watch. Such a simple classic design. And to me, it just uh, is really epitomizes what a great vintage watch should be. So let's get into this thing and see what we're working with. Looks like somebody scratched up the case trying to get into it before. And, oh no. <laughs> so this is missing a major part of the movement. It does not have a balance. <laughs> Well, uh, I guess I just found out why I got why I got such a good deal on the watch. No balance uh, certainly explains why it's not running. A quick look, uh, everything else looks good. As you can see, the movement is gorgeous, and yeah, it looks like the the mainspring's holding up as well as the pallet fork clicks over. And I'm gonna have to do something about the new balance. Now, I do have uh, a watch that I had scheduled to repair for myself, but. It is another Omega Seamaster 30 from this era that has a 286 movement in it, and I may be able to use the balance from that and maybe anything else that could be broken on here. I have never had this happen. Um, usually when a watch is broken, it's like broken. Uh, it's not missing parts, but somebody must have taken that out and then just decided to put the rest up on eBay. And I knew, I, well, look, when I bought it, it was advertised as not working as is. So it is very much a gamble when you do that on eBay. And uh, looks like they got me this time. Crazy. So we can start by taking off the hands. I'm just using simple hand levers here with a piece of plastic to protect the dial. I like these hands. They do have actually a little bit of loom in them, but the loom has um, has held up really well, and it's it's got that nice color that we all love in the old tritium loom hands. Now we can take the dial off. And off it comes. 
So this is the motion and key motion uh, the motion works and keyless works side of the movement and the dial, which by the way is a really important thing uh, when you're buying a vintage watch, a used vintage watch. The dial is critical and it looks really good. You can take the hour wheel off and we can transfer the movement over to a proper movement holder. I just absolutely adore this movement. I, I think it's just flat out gorgeous. It's also one of the first ones that I worked on and it's one of the only movements that I've taken apart multiple times. You know, movements are a lot like engines in a car, not just in the fact that they provide power to the watch and everything, but also in the way that they're made. You know, if, if you work on cars, and you work on the same engine over and over, you get to know it, right? You get to know the little ins and outs of it, the little tricks, the little, this is what this is for. This is how this fits in. And so this, you know, being not my first time working on a 286, I feel a lot more comfortable than I would with a brand new movement that I kind of have to figure everything out on. Next, we're going to uh, let down the mainspring here. So this again is just our way to make sure that there's no tension on the mainspring so that when we go through and take everything else out, there's, there's no big immediate letdown of all of that extra energy. So I'm letting the crown just slip through my fingers gently until the mainspring is all out of energy. Now, this is a, a wheel that sits on top of one of the train of wheels, and I have to use a special tool to remove it which is what you see me doing here. So there we go. That actually goes on the pivot of one of the train wheels. It has what they call an extended pivot, a very long one. You gotta be careful with those, of course. And now I can get further. This top part and that wheel that I took off a minute ago as well, these are all the way that they designed it so that it has center seconds. You know, it has the seconds hand that goes in the middle of the watch rather than off to the side or on the bottom. I can use my cannon pinion remover to take off the cannon pinion, and now we can start to get working over on the uh, on the winding part. So this is the crown wheel. The other one's called the ratchet wheel. I always used to get them confused, and then I realized that the crown wheel sits right next to the crown. Yeah, so that's how you remember that. kind of a pesky little crown wheel, but as you can see, there's actually two parts there. Technically, there's even a third one, but that, that piece right there as well. And now we can take off the ratchet wheel. Usually the ratchet wheel screw is the biggest screw, the flattest. It's, it's actually under a lot of torque from when you wind the watch and when it tries to unwind thanks to the main spring. And now we can remove the click and the click spring. This is a very simple device to just make sure that the ratchet wheel can only get wound up but not get wound down when you uh, stop winding. And the click spring on this is actually kind of an intricate little thing. So I'm going to use a stick here uh, uh, just to make sure that it doesn't fly away. Or at least try. Well, it didn't quite fly away. But as you can see, that spring is pretty crazy. Now we can take the barrel bridge off. If you're looking to get into this hobby and you want to work on a nice vintage watch that doesn't, you know, it doesn't completely break the bank, I would definitely recommend one of these Omega Seamaster 30s. They're about 36 millimeters in diameter, not the movement, but the watch itself, which makes it, you know, they still make watches that are that size. It's not one of these little tiny 
vintage watches, which I also work on too, but you know, wearability wise, it'll vary for you, but these are still a good dress watch size, I think. And they made a ton of different case and dial variations of these. Now we can remove the train wheel bridge. And that puts us a good chunk of the way through taking apart this side of the movement. So far, no more missing parts. Everything looks okay. So now we can take the center wheel out. And the third wheel, fourth, and there's the escape wheel as well. Now the only parts left here on this side at least are the barrel, which we just took off there, and then the pallets. So there's a little pallet bridge and then the pallets underneath that. Nice and gentle with the pallets as they do have a very, very small pivot on the top that can easily be bent or even just broken. And now the pallet fork can come out. Okay, so we've got this side all taken apart and now we can flip the movement over and notice that there's another broken part. So that is the setting lever spring, that big flat part, and that it's supposed to extend all the way over to the setting lever where there's a tensioned spring part. It's broken. I don't see it here at all either. Uh, you know, sometimes if that breaks off, it'll still be in the case, but it looks to me as if somebody was in this watch um, and kind of wanted to sell it and just that's why they put it up on that and then maybe just put this broken setting lever spring. The, the watch will actually work still without it at least a little bit, but it won't work well and it won't work for very long. So now we can take the yoke out. I'm just going to move the yoke spring off to the side so that I can grab it. And again, using the stick just to make sure that this thing doesn't take a spring on me, I can take out the yoke spring. That only leaves the keyless works, and then we've got this watch fully disassembled. And here we're going to be disassembling it, fully cleaning it, and then sourcing some new parts as it turns out. We need a new setting lever spring, at least, as well as a new balance. <laughs> Boy, you never know what you're going to get when it comes to these purchases, I'll tell you. All right, so let's get this thing in the baskets and then we can put it into the watch cleaning machine where these parts will be thoroughly cleaned and rinsed and then dried. That'll take off any of the old lubricant, contaminants, dirt, anything, and get it ready to be reassembled. One last thing we need to do though is take apart the mainspring barrel. And I can show you how I do this. I lift up the corner of the mainspring gently and try to get one thumb under it and then once I can get one other thumb under it, like that, then I can start gently taking the spring out. You do want to be very careful. Always keep one hand on the other side of this. If I were to let go at this point, it would all come flying out in one big motion. And that has a lot of downside. Uh, it can hurt your eyes or just scratch you. But also the mainspring coming uncoiling that quickly can have it break or get damaged. You can also just make a mess if there's a bunch of grease in there. So nice and gentle, take the entire mainspring out just like that. And it's gonna go in the watch cleaning machine as well. Normally I would put the balance in with it here, but 
<laughs> there isn't one. <laughs> so I guess I don't have to do that. All right, all set for the cleaning machine. And now we can turn our attention to the case. Now, one thing I've been doing on this channel is experimenting, learning, starting to push my boundaries with case restoration and dials and hands and stuff like that. Generally speaking, I'm not a huge fan of it, but there are times when I have restored the case and really liked it, seriously thought it was great. And I've decided that when I deem it tasteful, I will be doing uh, upgrades or, or minor refurbishment to the cases and to the hands and stuff how I see fit. I'm going to use my own judgment on it. And on this watch, you know, I kind of have it in my mind that I might give this watch uh, as a gift to a family member. And I'm going to do it. I'm going to restore this thing and make it look really nice again. Some of the scratches and stuff on this aren't the kind of nice warm patina. They're more just like scratches. And I think I can take those out. So here's what I'm going to do. Starting with the case back, I'm going to use these flat sanders that go all the way from 400 grit up to 7,000 grit over eight sequences. And I am going to restore this case. So let's get into it. As you can see, I'm going up one sander at a time. And this is starting to look pretty good. Not too bad after what actually was about mm, an hour or so of sanding. Now I'm going to put a bunch of tape on it and try to kind of get to see if I can see the, uh, the logo and stuff a little bit better because that got kind of scratched up and we can see the cool uh, Seamaster logo on the bottom if I can just gently sand it. Now this is a balancing act because I don't want to take off too much material and make it so you, the logo's gone. So that's coming along and now I need to look at this case. It's fairly straightforward but it is pretty thin so I'm going to put some uh, some tape on the lugs and I'm going to do the bezel and the sides the best I can with my sanding sticks and this is basically just a lot of time and effort. That's really what it is. I'm trying to be as careful as I can with the flat surfaces. That's why I'm using the sanders that are on these sticks. And I'm working my way up slowly, one at a time, trying to take off the least amount of material possible. And this is how it came out. Not too bad. A nice little refresher on the case. I did some graining over the Seamaster logo, just very light graining so it wasn't super shiny and then the edge gets to stay shiny. And you know what? I'm good with that. That's exactly what I wanted. So here's the broken <laughs> setting lever spring right there. That little post is where the spring is supposed to be. And boom, this is the one I took off the other watch. So the movement in the other watch was totally fine. The case it was a bad case. It was a plated case. And the dial wasn't great either. So here's the balance from it. I got it on the microscope here just to take a good close look at it. But these are going to be donors that are going to be going into this watch. And I noticed also just while inspecting parts, look at the damage on the pallet forks of this watch. I don't know what would cause that groove, the grooves that you see there. But there, you can see them here as well. There's like actually grooves on the jewel of the pallet fork. So I'm going to be replacing that as well because I figure that can't be good, right? And while I'm here, I also like to inspect the parts and I notice that even after having gone through the watch cleaning machine, there's still a little bit of residue here on some of the jewels. So I'm going to grab my peg wood and just clean them up. Um, just make sure what that is, is dried oil. That that's oil from previous services that has been in there for years and years and it dries up and that kind of thing can affect the amplitude and this is what a clean jewel should look like. How do you like that? It's beautiful, isn't it? And as you can see, there's a little bit of oil on these ones as well. So, you know, some manual labor is needed and I'm just going to go ahead and, and go through here, through all the jewels really and uh, use my peg wood to help clean them out and then I'll have to uh, do another cleaning on them because the peg wood will leave behind some kind of, uh, you know, little bit of material just because it's wood so it's an organic material so it kind of falls apart. So I'll use some Rotico and as you can see these jewels look much better after I've gotten in there and clean them. And you know, a lot of the times the watch cleaning machine will get this uh, type of stuff. A lot of times it won't though. And you need to go through and manually clean. And this is why I inspect the parts on the microscope 
before doing reassembly because I want to make sure that they're actually clean. And you can see how dried on, look at how dried on that oil is onto the jewel. It actually takes some pretty good pressure and a lot of rubbing on the peg wood before it'll actually come up. Much better. Okay, and that means we can begin reassembly of the watch. We've got the case polished up, but not too much. Again, tastefully done is what I'm aiming for here. And we've got replacement parts plus fully cleaned watch all ready to go and get back together. So first things first, we're gonna start with the mainspring, getting it back in the barrel. So the first thing I'm gonna do is take some Mobius 8200 and just push a little bit between my finger cots and then I'm just gonna run it along the length of the mainspring. This, the idea here is to put a very, very, very thin layer of that grease on there. And that's just to protect from corrosion and, and make sure that uh, nothing gets in there too badly, but you really don't need that much. Now I can take my watch winders, my mainspring winders, and I just need to find the right size of winder to go on the handle, and then I can wind the mainspring back into the barrel effectively. You end up putting it on an arbor here that is like a substitute for the, for the arbor that you can see sitting on the block in order to wind it in. And here we go. Once you get the size right and everything, it's really not too bad. These are very finicky little tools to use, but they are invaluable. Otherwise you have to do this by hand and doing it by hand is very difficult and also um, dramatically increases the risk that you'll damage the mainspring. Oh, favorite sound. Here it is, listen. Oh yeah, I it, it never gets old. There's so many cool feelings when you're doing this hobby. And to me, that's one of my favorites. Somebody did comment on one of the videos and said that their favorite feeling in the hobby was when you lose a spring on the ground and then you, you see it. <laughs> and I can confirm it is an amazing feeling as well. Also up there is when a watch that wasn't running before begins to run. That's a, that's a great feeling. There's a lot. I, I'm telling you, this is such a fun thing to do. I, I just really can't re recommend it highly enough. And a big impetus for me starting this channel was to share my journey with you to help inspire you in case you were interested in this type of thing. Okay. So now I got this little tool to put the cap back on the mainspring barrel and it is all set to go, which means we can start getting to reconstructing the actual watch. I'm going to start by doing the train of wheels. And that's wheel number one, the mainspring barrel. And that's wheel number five, although they don't actually call it the fifth wheel, they call it the escape wheel. I don't know who came up with the naming conventions for these, but a lot of these have multiple names. That's the fourth wheel there. third wheel. And I'm going to put a little bit of lubricant on the main wheel here. And as you can see, it sits right up against the mainspring barrel. Also, just take a moment to look at how gorgeous this movement is. Beautifully laid out. The colors, the surfaces, absolutely love this thing. It's also a pleasure to work on. Really get a better appreciation for the design of these movements when you start working on them and seeing how they go back together and the little, the little things that the manufacturers and the designers did to help make your life a little easier. Okay, now we can put the, the bridge here for the train wheels, but I have to be very careful because I'm trying to make sure that all the pivots are lined up. And that means I'm gonna push down a little bit with this stick, but I can't push too hard or I'll bend one or break one. And as you can see, it's not quite seated properly. And 
So it just takes a little bit of tweaking here. I need to get all three of those pivots in those red jewel holes that you see on top of the bridge or else it won't work. And there we go. That's what we wanted to see. When I turn that, the escape wheel turns, which means the fourth wheel is also turning, which means we're good to go. So let's snug down this bridge. And now we can grab the, uh, the setting lever screw. And this is just gonna kind of sit here and then on top of it goes this bridge and you can see it kind of snugs, snuggles over it. I think this one I can actually put in after, but oftentimes you have to put it on first. This is the, the barrel bridge going on now. And once again, I'm just giving it a, a quick check to make sure that it's running freely. This one's a lot easier to put on than the other because it only has one jeweled hole that needs to go on on that center wheel. And then the only other thing is the main bridge, uh, main bridge, the main spring barrel, the, the arbor sticks up there and you can see I have to get it on that. It's only two holes in there big though versus the three little tiny pivots on the, on the other bridge. Okay, we've got that on. Now I'm gonna do a little bit of oiling here. The little tool that you use is called an oiler and they come in different sizes, depending on how much oil you're actually looking to put down either into the pivot or onto the parts that you're doing. I'm putting a little bit of HP 1300, which is a synthetic oil on where the crown wheel is gonna go. Okay, that looks good. Now I can oil the the uh, the bushing there for the mainspring barrel. I can put the click spring in. Once again, I'm using a little stick there just to give myself an insurance plan in case that spring decides it doesn't want to sit still. And there's a click going into place. And now we can put the ratchet wheel on. Now the ratchet wheel, you have to take extra special care because if you notice the square in the middle or the hole in the middle is a square. And that's because it fits over where the barrel arbor sticks up so that when the barrel arbor turns, it turns the wheel with it. And you just have to make sure that that gets lined up before you screw it down because otherwise it won't wind. You'll just be turning that, uh, turning the crown and nothing will happen. And just making sure this is good and tight. Now you don't want to overdo it on basically any of these screws, but you know, Solid and tight is where you want to go. And as you can see, I can still move the main spring barrel and see that everything goes. So now I can get in on the microscope and start to do some oiling of these pivots. And there we go. Uh, the, the trick with these, and I'm still learning, but the trick is to actually do really not that much. 
it, it's actually a very, very, very small amount of oil. I think people think that you can see there's kind of a cup on top that you need to fill that up with oil. And generally speaking, you don't. That If you've done that, it's usually, it usually means that you've actually put in too much. But it turns out putting such a small amount of oil is actually difficult. It, it takes practice, and I'm still learning it, that's for sure. All right, I'm going to put the cannon pinion on. And the minute wheel. And this is an intermediate wheel for the motion works. That just means that it transfers the turning motion of one thing to another thing. That's, that's all it means when it's an intermediate wheel. And now I can also get in some of the keyless works here itself. That's the sliding clutch and the clutch wheel as well. These actually have ratcheting teeth on them that let you turn it one direction but not the other while winding. That's why when you wind your watch, you can feel tension when you turn it one direction, but then when you wind it back, it does it feels loose, kind of like a like on a bicycle, if you've ever had that feeling, where if you push the pedals forward, you can feel tension, but when you whirl them backwards, they just spin freely. It's the same type of deal. Now we can put the winding stem in after getting lubrication on it, as well as the setting lever. Now this is kind of a tricky operation, but I'm holding the setting lever on with my finger so that I can screw in the setting lever screw on the other side until it grabs, and then the setting lever will fall and uh, will slip into place. Using a little bit of grease here, just because these are fairly high friction areas. I'm using a little bit on the post here as well for the yoke spring, or for the yoke, excuse me. And here it goes. And you can see how it engages with the sliding clutch there. It goes into a groove on the top of it. And then the yoke spring provides tension, constant tension as it turns out. And once again, this little stick comes in very handy as I slip the yoke spring back into place. And that spring is actually under a heck of a lot of tension. You can see how bent up it is pushing on that arm. It's a lot. And once again, a little bit of grease in between the, uh, the spring and the yoke just to provide some lubrication for the tension there. I got put a little bit too much on. So whenever I do this, I just use a little bit of Rotico to clean it up. Now I can put the new setting lever spring in as well. And as you can see, this one actually has the spring attached to it as well. That goes all the way over to the setting lever. Now this part also has a dual purpose though. It's not just the spring. It's also a cover plate for the, uh, for the yoke. As you can see, it, it holds it down and in place as well. So it's actually serving multiple roles. And you know, that's part of the genius of the engineering of these little marvels. Now that I have the setting lever spring in place, I can loosely tighten it down with my screwdriver and then I can actually click it over so that it's engaged with the setting lever itself. Just like this. There we go. So now it's in and now I can fully tighten down the setting lever spring. And now I can do a little bit of grease here where it engages the setting lever spring and engages with the setting lever. And I'll just click it over and then put a little grease on the other side. These parts are held under a lot of tension and that is definitely not a place that you would want there to be super high friction. As if something got stuck, it would likely just break the spring. In fact, that may be what happened to the spring that came in this watch. Okay, now we can flip the watch over and uh, continue on with the other side. There's not that many more parts though. We can put the pallet forks in and then the balance and see if it'll run. Again, this is a donor balance from a different watch. So it's the same model. So it's from a 286 from Omega. So it should work, but you know, sometimes they're not, sometimes they need a little bit of encouragement.
And again, a very gentle process here of putting this pallet fork bridge in place and gently making sure that the pallet fork is engaged with the jewels on the top and bottom because once you tighten the thing down, if it's not engaged, you're very likely to snap off of pivot or bend it. And again, I want to be very careful around the pallet fork as it is a delicate device. Also, this is the one from the other watch as well. And I figure that this serves two purposes. One, the jewels from that other one were clearly damaged. They were marred by something. So I didn't like that. And then also this pellet fork goes, uh, was also the one that was used with the other escapement. So I figured that can't hurt. So put a little bit of wind in the watch and make sure that power is getting transferred all the way through the train of wheels and to the pellet fork. And it is, which means we can put in this balance. Now I did clean this balance, um, before, so I just didn't put it on camera, but I did clean the balance itself. And let's do a test fit and see if this watch will run with the balance from a different Omega 286 movement. I would love it if it would, because if it does, then I, it means I still got a decent deal on the watch. If I have to go try to buy a brand new movement or balance, then it's a whole nother deal. Well, it fits okay, at least so far. Oh, and there it goes. Ah, it's finally kicked back up. I just needed to push the, the base of the bridge down a little bit there, and then it engaged, and now it is just happily running along, and I am elated to see that. <laughs> it's kind of a bummer when you get your watch and you realize that it's just outright missing parts, but when you happen to have them, it's great. Now, one thing I haven't done yet is clean the cap jewels on the balance. So let's get under the microscope and do that. I'm using my very fine tweezers here to lift up the shock jewel setting. Underneath that, there will be a cap jewel. And there we go. <laughs> they are finicky little things though. And I'm going to use a piece of Rotico to extract this jewel and jewel setting. And now you can see them there on the piece of paper. I take them out of the one dip cleaner and I'm going to apply a very, very small dot of oil in the center of the cap jewel. And then I can use the setting and just set it upside down on it and it'll kind of suck together because of capillary action and then I can replace it back in the movement. This is a very, very, very tedious little thing to do and boop, there it goes. One of the interesting things about this that I didn't know um, and learned later, thanks to getting some advice, was that you should actually use big tweezers on the little tiny jewels when they're on your bench. That did not occur to me. Um, when I thought about it, I thought, well, it's the smallest part, so I should use the smallest tweezers. And it turns out the opposite is true because you basically just spring load the tweezers on the little tiny part and it'll go flying across the room. So lesson learned there. And now we can continue with the build. Again, this little mechanism on the top is for the center seconds. And, and that's just the seconds hand that goes around the middle of the watch where Traditionally, older watches, if you look at older pocket watches and such, that seconds hand is usually its own hand, either down at 6 o'clock or over at 9 o'clock. And uh, this is a way that you can, that Omega determined that they could get it so that there was a center hand that displayed the seconds rather than having it offset. And it's an ingenious little thing. I, it's really not difficult, though. It's interesting. There's an extended pivot off of the third wheel, and then it interfaces with a wheel, which we'll have to put on in just a second, and then that interfaces with the little thing that I'm putting on right now to turn a pivot on the other side that you attach a hand to. It, it's interesting because it's just not that complicated, but also you had to figure that this is a problem that they really had to work to solve. So it, it, it was difficult, I'm sure, to, to engineer. 
Now this is actually attached directly to one of the train wheels, as I mentioned, and I can just friction fit it back on the top and we're done. Now I can flip this thing over and get the motion works going. So that's called the hour wheel. It goes on top of the cannon pinion and it'll engage with the minute wheel below. And then there's also a dial washer. This keeps the hour hand or the hour wheel from sliding around. And now I can put the dial back on the watch. Again, I love this dial. Look, it's nothing super fancy, but it's a beautiful clean dial and it actually has a little tiny bit of pattern to it as well. Now these are the dial, they're called the dial screws. They go on the side of the case. And basically the dial feet go into a little chamber. And then when you screw in the dial screws, it kind of pushes up against the side of the dial foot to hold it in place. It's very simple. Very, very simple design, but effective. All right, so now the dial's back on. And I'm just gonna go over the dial with a little bit of clean Rodigo here, just to make sure that there's no dust or smudges on it. You know, I do my best not to put any additional ones on, but sometimes they come with a little bit of dirt or smudge on them, and I can use that just to kind of pick that up before getting to putting on the hands. As I mentioned, I'm not gonna be redoing the hands on this watch because frankly, I think they look fantastic. The loom has patinaed beautifully. It's got that lovely color. And I didn't need to put any tea or coffee on them to get it. They're just like that naturally. So there's the hour hand on. Another nice thing about working on these, if you are just getting into the hobby and you want to kind of step it up to your first real vintage watch, if you know what I mean, um, you know, there's no date on this. So it's a good stepping stone in that way as well, where the date just adds more uh, complexity to a build. And, uh, you know, when you're learning, you, you don't necessarily need to push that envelope so hard. It's <laughs> turns out watches are complicated enough. And then when you're more comfortable, you can move to dates. Just quickly testing the hands. What I'm testing for is to make sure that the, everything lines up correctly, but also that the hands don't touch each other as they work their way around the dial. And now we can put that running center seconds hand on, or theoretically we can put it on. Tricky little thing. There we go. And these just need a very gentle little push with the hand setter. You don't need to shove these uh, on. It's just a good little firm press and uh, and the hand will will stick on and there we go we're even displaying the seconds just like we were hoping so beautiful this watch is coming right along and again just making sure that the hands don't touch and that includes the seconds hand touching the minute hand there's very slight tolerance there okay so let's put this thing on the time grapher and see how it does Good amplitude, 280 degrees. The rate's not great at minus 11 seconds, and the beat error's not great at 0.9 milliseconds. You'd rather have that down into the you know, 0 0.10, maybe 0 0.2 range rather than 0.9, but the truth is the beat error doesn't actually affect timekeeping. It has other effects uh, on the watch, but as far as timekeeping goes, I can regulate this watch as it sits, and that's what I'm gonna do for now. It looks like that uh, beat error is about 0.9 or 1 millisecond, so I'm going to have to go back and tweak that. But for the purposes of the video, I'm trying to get the timekeeping good. And as you can see, I got it to 0 seconds, maybe minus 2, at 283 degrees of amplitude. And I am happy with that for now. I'll have to go back and adjust the, uh, the beat error after the video is done. So now I can replace the crystal. And I got a new crystal for the case, and I've got my rober press. This is one of the ways that you can re replace a crystal, and in my mind, it's the best way. This is the way that I was taught. Um, I watched, and many of you have asked uh, what classes I've taken or what I've done, because I, I am an amateur. This is a hobby for me, but I have taken some classes. They've all been from Mark Lovick over at the Watch Repair channel here on YouTube, and he's got a wonderful little series of classes. Uh, there's currently three courses 
and it looks like a fourth one um, in development. And I definitely recommend going over to watchrepairlessons.com if you want to check them out. And in case you were wondering, no, I, I am not being paid for this or anything. In fact, I didn't even tell Mark. Uh, it's just, I just recommend it because I recommend it. I, I learned a lot from the classes. It teaches you the basics and really kind of gets you going on, uh, on how to get started in the hobby. And one of the tools that he has is a rubber press. And I found one of these uh, vintage one on eBay and it is great. Look how quickly I can put this crystal on. Safe, clean, no scratches, and the crystal's in. Just me telling you about the website, <laughs> I was able to replace the crystal. And, you know, I'm still learning how to use the thing. So that says a lot. Now we got to look at the back of the, the case here though. And there's a, this looks like it was at one point, some type of O-ring or gasket, but it is now hardened so much that it's basically just like hard plastic in here. <laughs> look at it. It just cracks when I take it out. And so I need to get all of this out of here so that I can replace this with a proper functioning O-ring that might actually provide some level of uh, water resistance and seal and seal up the case. But this is extremely hardened gasket here. So I need to go around carefully and take this thing out. So I'll speed this up because it did take me a little while to actually work my way around. And uh, there were some parts that were a little more stuck in than others. But as you can see, I did end up getting all of that old gasket out of there. And of course I made a little bit of a mess while doing it, but Hey, that's part of the deal, right? And that's also why I have one of these little air blowers. So now I'm just going to measure that inside diameter of that ring uh, so that I can figure out which a gasket to use and I've got little bags of sized gaskets that I can grab from theoretically I can grab them and there we go before I do that though I need to make sure that I put it on this uh, silicone grease cleaner thing you just give it a few twists in there and it'll get the silicone grease into the gasket and also just clean it off And the grease helps you place it, and it also keeps the gasket in better condition for longer. Of course, the downside to these rubber gaskets is that they can uh, deteriorate to the point that they harden like this one did. They can kind of melt and become a sticky mess, at least the old ones can. Uh, or more commonly, they can just get brittle and crack, and then they're no longer effective. So this grease helps lengthen their life. And I'm just sort of working my way around here, pressing this gasket into place. And there we go. New gasket installed. And now we can start finishing up the final casing on this little project. Movement looks great in the case. I can also put on these little gaskets that go on the case on the crown tube. <laughs> Theoretically, I can put these on. You think this would be the easy part? There we go. And again, this is just to help keep it watertight. Uh, for vintage watches like this, I wouldn't recommend taking them in any amount of water. I mean, you can wash your hands with them and stuff, but generally speaking, unless you know for sure that this has been brought back to original spec, as far as uh, water tightness goes, you, it's better just to assume that some water could get in and not go surfing with watches like this. And these are the case holders here. So all this, the, the these are just little, uh, pieces that hold the movement and the inside the case. This also makes sure that the dial is flush with the outer ring so that it sits clean so that when you look at the watch, there's not a gap along the edge. 
And these are just, again, I, I have to just give props. Just everything done right here. Just a beautiful little part that fits perfectly. It's the little things, you know. Okay, get this movement secured in the case. And now we can put the case back on. And as you can see, you can now read it. <laughs> and I did manage to get most of that huge scratch that was on the back out as well. And I'll just go ahead and use this ball to tighten down the back for now. I can put this on the same machine that I used to take it out, but look at how well this watch came out. Is that not just flat out gorgeous? I, the, the beauty that these little things have is just, it never ceases to amaze me, especially, you know, I gotta say, I really like how it came out with the light polish as well, just to bring it back. Again, I'm not trying to reinvent the wheel or round off a bunch of corners. I'm just trying to give it a little bit of, of new life. And, you know, with the, the dial being a little bit, having a little bit of patina, just that warm kind of glow to it. I just think this watch is absolutely flat out gorgeous. And, uh, well, even though it did throw us a few curveballs along the way, I'm really, really happy with how this watch turned out. So that is going to do it for this video. First off, I want to say thank you for taking the time to hang out. And, you know, I love reading the comments on these videos. And uh, I mentioned before, but a big impetus for me starting the channel was to help share this hobby that I found so fascinating with other people. And it always makes me smile when I see that there are other people that are interested in the hobby and in these little uh, mechanical wonders that we work on. So thanks for that. Um, I also want to mention uh, that I did start a Patreon for this channel. That is a way that you can support this channel if you like what I'm doing here. Uh, you can check it out at patreon.com slash wristwatch revival. And I want to say thank you to Samuel, James, Russell, Caleb, Adam, Brenton, Dustin, Stan, and Kelsey uh, for supporting me over there. Uh, it really does mean the world to me. Uh, and it unlocks more possibilities for more videos and doing more things with the videos. Because as you might imagine, these videos are extremely uh, resource intensive, shall we say. I can also be found, by the way, over at Instagram, wristwatch underscore revival over there. And you can get some project updates and little, you know, goings on on my bench in between video uploads. Or you can also just say hi. Also, any watches that I decide to sell, I'll likely be putting up over on Instagram. So if you're interested in that, that would be the place to go. I'm still figuring out how to do that exactly. But uh, yeah, that's where you can find me. With that, just wanted to say thanks again for hanging out. We'll see you next time.